This episode is brought to you by DAZN. Get ready for a season of football and soccer on DAZN. Stream every NFL, Premier League, and UEFA Champions League game on DAZN. Watch live and on demand. Start your free trial at DAZN.com. That's D-A-Z-N.com. DAZN. Game. Changed. Welcome to the official Tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we have the privilege of being with a young, up-and-coming superstar. His name is Zach Spider, and he has just won Kalamazoo for the second time. What might have been the third time if we didn't have a pandemic last year? So mm-hmm. those who know about Nats at the zoo, you know it's how hard it is to win it once and let alone twice and what that means for a kid's career being able to do it twice. We want to welcome Zach to the show. Zach, thank you for showing up, brother. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. So so let me tell you, or let me ask you, you win yeah. Kalamazoo twice. How do the girls in your high school feel about that? The girls. Do they know? Do they Uh, know? Like, oh, man, this dude, he is about to get the bag. He's about to get paid real soon. (laughs) So we may want to be his friend. Do they really get what that means? I'm starting to see that a little bit, checking my DMs now. Uh, But um, (laughs) but, um, I don't know, man. I have a girlfriend at the moment. So, you know, I have a girlfriend, so, uh, you know, I try not to look too much at that. Oh, yeah, you got to delete, 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 delete. Oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) Delete all the DMs, delete all the DMs, delete all the DMs. You know, that's a a good thing. Or, you know, you just post a picture with your girlfriend so that they know, so that they stop stop texting. I know. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, man. (laughs) So the reason why I ask is because, You know, in tennis, it's not like the NBA draft, right? NBA draft, you know who's getting drafted. Everyone knows what that means. That means this person's about to, you know, be on television, get signed. You know, his life Mm -hmm. is about to change. But in our sport, you know, we are like super small sport. And as it relates to junior tennis, Kalamazoo is like the Super Bowl of junior tennis. So I'm always curious as to... You know, when Sam, when, when Donald Young won, you know, Kalamazoo, uh, you won it, you know, do are people locked in and tuned in as to what that means? It sounds mm-hmm. like maybe a few. Yeah. No, it means, you know, <laughs> it's pretty incredible, uh, especially winning it twice. Um, I mean, yeah, I won it two years ago when I was 16. And when I won it there, I was just really surprised. I didn't know what to go in to expect and anything I got a wild card I didn't even want to play it till like the last week and then I was like you know what I'll play it because I didn't do any junior tournaments for about five years or so so that was pretty much that was my first junior tournament and um yeah no when I won that it was pretty amazing kind of switched my whole life lifestyle around so let me ask you this so Venus and Serena you know they're famous for not playing any junior tournaments you know, and then making it on the tour. But there's not a lot of people who sort of took that approach. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I'm a coach, right? So even as coaches, we say, hey, you know what? You need to go and see how you measure up, right? Learn how to hit the ball is one thing, but learning how to win and compete is a different thing. So since you didn't play tournaments for five years, what did you do to learn how to compete, right? Because at the end of the day, you're not just hitting balls. Just like, you know, it's hand-to-hand combat out there, especially on, you know, on the men's side. So how did you, what did you do to like learn how to compete? Yeah. I mean, I didn't play for five years. So the closest thing possible to a tournament was practice matches, which still, you know, it's much different with the pressure and everything going into a tournament or a practice match. But I just did a lot of practice matches for pretty much those five years. And I mean, we couldn't afford to travel all around the world. And also we, my coach and my parents didn't think I didn't want to either like, uh, play any more junior tournaments for a long time um, we just didn't really see a point we wanted to do something different and um, we just wanted to train and get better 
by the time I was younger up until now, like 16, 17, 18. So you talk about playing practice matches. Are these against, you know, fortunately you're in California, right? When you got schools all up and down the West Coast, USC, right. San Diego State, um, you know, UCLA's at USC. So you have probably more people within your range. But who would you play against? Is it just coaches, other pros and, you know, on the West Coast uh, or other mm -hmm. kids your age? Yeah, it helped a lot having the colleges around here, especially here in California. But I never practiced when I was younger with like kids my age. I don't remember the last time I ever did that. Um, we had a, I was practicing a lot at University of San Diego with the college guys there. Uh, when I was probably, I started when I was like eight or nine. And um, then when I turned about, uh, I think 12 or 13, I'm not sure. We had a college guy. We had a college guy living with us for about two years. Mm. And so that helped a lot. I would hit with him every day, mm. you know, and just, you know, do practice matches, even though it was less pressure because it's a practice match, but we just wanted to do that for those four or five years before getting into the, into the pros. Mm. So you had a living, we, we call that a living in sort of sparring <laughs> partner, coach, hidden partner, all of that, that, now that that's convenient. Right. Yeah, no, that helped a lot for sure. Um, yeah, it was nice having all the colleges around here. But no, I always hit with the college guys, never really any juniors when I was younger. So take me back because the you all's approach is so laid back. It's like, yeah, I didn't really want to play Kalamazoo, but I did. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I got a wild card to Junior French Open, but I didn't go. Right. You know, mm -hmm. some people sort of like would be so neurotic, right? And overzealous about sort of doing these things so take me back to when you started playing tennis was it were your parents on a mission to make you a tennis player or was it just some oh this seemed you know something fun to do yeah um I started when I was two and uh they never forced me to do anything we, uh, my dad brought me out on the court because he used to play when I was two and uh I just picked up a racket started hitting balls and I like pretty much fell in love with it and um, they never forced me to do anything. It was always me wanting to go out on the court because if they saw if I didn't like it or something, they wanted, you know, I would do something else. Um, but yeah, I started when I was two and uh, yeah, just pretty much fell in love with it. So then did either your parents have a tennis pedigree? You know, because I always find it that a lot of people who make it are like second or third generation tennis players, right? So the parents mm -hmm. at this point, they know, okay, you got to do this, you got to do this. Then when you turn eight, you got to do this. Then you got to get a private lesson. Then you got to go to this group and you got to go to this, you know, junior camp, et cetera. Do they have a pedigree or were they, you know, just out there messing around and you just, you know, sort of trying to figure it out and stumble into the right path? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, my dad got me into it because he used to play all through junior. He played Kalamazoo too, and he played in college. And uh, he played a few pro tournaments, but nothing too much. Then he went into coaching. Um, but yeah, he was the one who got me into it uh, when I was two. And then thankfully, uh, when I was like four or five, I was already starting, I guess, to hit the ball over the net pretty well, supposedly. And my coach, he actually still works with me. His name is Matt Hanlon. He's one of my coaches and, you know, like family of ours. And uh, he saw me one day hitting and he was like, I love to coach him work with him and here we are now i'm 18 and we're, he's still part of the team so yeah so your dad was a coach so did your dad initially teach you how to hold the racket he was giving you the private lessons uh and sort of setting everything up yeah my dad got me into it uh I, yeah he was the one setting everything up mm -hmm. now at what point did it become hard or even is it is it not at that point yet for dad to be the coach and for mm -hmm. what happens on the tennis court to carry home, because, you know, you travel with a player. I've traveled with a bunch of players and we have a bad practice or a bad match. And then we get in the car and we're not speaking to each other. Right. We get mm -hmm. in dinner and you're on the phone. So you know, is it that way now, or, you know, what point did it get tough for the, the dad to also be the coach and for the environment to sort of, merge together mm -hmm. no yeah that part's tough because i see him pretty much every day but um no when i was younger he was 
uh, on me pretty well, like, you know, the tennis wise, but now as I'm getting older, he's much more laid back and um, he's still part of the team, but it's nice having other people too, hearing other people's voices. But um, no, especially on some bad days, it could get tough, you know, you know it's, your, it's your dad, of course, but um, no, I, I, it's awesome having, still having him part of the team and listening to like other people's voices too. So I feel like that helps me a lot. So let me ask you this. So when every tennis family, there's always like a parent that's like the good cop, bad cop. And, mm-hmm. and, and as parents, you kind of orchestrate it. You're going to, you know, one parent says, you know what, I'm going to be good cop and you're going to be bad cop. Mm-hmm. When you had those tough practices and you had to go home, was your mom like the good cop? And you're like, my yeah. dad did this and dad did that. and did it. <laughs> You got it. Yeah. I would always go to my mom when I was like, six seven eight years old um yeah my mom would always try to cheer me up I know my dad still loved me he just cared for me a lot and just wanted the best for me but because like you know on the court it may may not be too pretty but then after we'll we'll be at the beach together or something you know trying to forget about the tennis so Hmm. um but no it's always uh sometimes it works out for people having their (laughs) father or like their parents as their coach but I like having that mix too, like having my dad there with me because I, I need him there, but then also having other people's voices like my other coaches. All right, so how old were you when you all started to bring in that, you know, additional voices into the fold? Um, Matt works with me. His name's Matt Hanlon. He started working with me at like five years old. And so he's still part of the team. He's been, he lives in Texas now, but I was probably 16 years old when I started where I kind of wanted, I kind of told my dad too, like, I want to have, I still want you part of the team, but I like to have other people with me so I could hear different voices. And he was all for it too. Um, So I I was, I was probably 16. Now that's a big step because a lot of famous tennis dads, a lot of dads on tour that are, you know, still around and a lot of players have a hard time having that conversation even Mm -hmm. though they know it's best right so how did you get the courage to have that was it something you went to your mom and was like mom I gotta talk to dad can you help me can we rehearse this conversation (laughs) right or was it just like you know you just bossed Mm -hmm. up and was like I'm just gonna say what I want to say yeah no pretty much I just wanted to say what I wanted to say and I know he wants the best for me whatever it is even if I don't want to have him at all part of the team or if I want to have him with other people or whatever it is. So I know I want it. I know I want it to turn out in a bad way and he was all for it. And he actually agreed too. he was like, you know, I think we need some other people too. So we could all be a team together. And so it, it turned out good, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> now that's, that's definitely a success story. So let me ask you this. You win Kalamazoo at 16. You know, for those that don't know, you get the wild card to the U S open. Who'd you play first round? I played Paulo Lorenzi. Yeah. Um, veteran. I think, yeah, I was 16. He was 37, I think, 38. I don't know. He's much older. But um, uh, no, that was a great experience. I didn't know what to expect going into that. So tell me this, you know, because the first time I walked into Arthur Ashe Stadium, it was like, whoa, this is big. You know, Arthur Ashe is bigger than, like, most NBA stadiums, right? Mm. So, you know, it didn't sound like, you know, this was sort of your dream, right? And you were, like, living and breathing to become a professional tennis player. It seemed like you sort of took a, you know, more casual approach. If it happens, it happens. Whatever, I'm not going to stress over it. So tell me that feeling that you had when you first go to the U.S. Open and you stand in the credential office, Mm -hmm. right, down that hallway right there waiting to get your credentials right outside the stadium. Tell me what that what that felt like when you first arrived at the site. Yeah, no, that was amazing. I always dreamt of that. Like, you know, I didn't know when or that was going to happen. I wasn't thinking 16. I was thinking more, you know, reality maybe in my early 20s or whatever it is. But it was a cool experience that at 16. But um, no, it was amazing. Like when I first flew into New York, I had the Mercedes-Benz driver pick me up. I'm like, whoa, what? is going on now you know like everything everything changed so quick um my whole life lifestyle now it was pretty amazing and it was just like i've always been dreaming of that and it was just cool to see it you know showing up to the side or uh, being be in new york playing the main draw 
Now, what hotel do you stay at? I've, I've, I've been in the U.S. Open seven years in a row, and I've got, you know, good and bad stories about hotels. What, what hotel did you stay at? Uh, what was it called? We stayed at the Hyatt um, in oh, the Grand Manhattan. Hyatt. The Grand Hyatt, that's it. Yeah. Grand Hyatt on 42nd. Okay. Got it. So you go to U.S. Open for the first time. Junior starts the second week of the Open. So everybody mm-hmm. in the round of 16 is still there then we always say the juniors invade the second week, right? You all start coming in the second week, the cafeteria gets crowded all over again. Right. Right. The players and the pros and, 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 you know, how did, who was the first person you saw where you like, Ooh, where just sort of stopped you in your tracks and you sort of were like a little bit of like in awe of. Right. Actually it was a Roger. Uh, it was the first person who I saw when I went inside the locker room when I first got there the first day. And he actually remembered me because I practiced with him at Indian Wells before. Uh, I think, I think it was that year. Yeah. And he was like, you know, he remembered my name and everything. So that was like, Whoa, I got, I was like, you actually remember me. I was pretty, it was pretty amazing. That that is amazing. (laughs) But I will say, although he is, you know, the GOAT, he, he probably is one of the most humble people yeah. on tour. And mm-hmm. you'd be surprised how many names he actually knows, not just on the men's side, on the women's side. He keeps track, right? Coaches, he's always acknowledging people. So that doesn't surprise me that he would still remember you and sort of welcome you in. Now, when the draw comes out, right? So, you know, the draw comes out on Friday, right? And there's always sort mm-hmm. of one person that, everyone hopes to avoid, right? Whether, you know, Gael Monfils is somebody that's famous, right? For not being seated, but probably should be seated, right? Or Nick Kyrgios, not being seated because his ranking drop, but should mm-hmm. be seated. Do you have a player that you were hoping to play? And do you have a player that you were like, Lord, please don't let me play him? Um, definitely not Nadal. I did not want to play the dog because I did not want to get embarrassed out there on Ash. <laughs> but um, I actually I wanted to play uh, either Roger just because he remembered me, so I thought that would be it's Roger, you know, it's like that would be amazing, or actually uh, John Isner because he's a good friend of mine, so I thought that would have been really fun too, uh, mm-hmm. playing against them. But yeah, I so saw when the draws came out, it was uh, Kevin Anderson, and so we were preparing for that I got all these stats all kinds of stuff like practicing with Isner now because he has a bigger serve trying to find everything and then it came down to like I think two days before the match he had to pull out I think because of uh, I forgot what he injured and so I was like oh does that mean I'm in second round of US Open <laughs> but uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to think but uh, then that's when uh, Lorenzi came in as a lucky loser and uh, yeah, we had to like switch the course because I was going to be on like uh, Armstrong Stadium or something. And then we had to switch it over to court five. Um, it was definitely much different, but I was actually, you know, happy I played him than like Kevin Anderson or someone. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. But now, that, now that's something too. It's, it's, you can always tell where you're going to play based on who you're going to play. So right. anybody that draws fed, they're going to play first night, night match on Ash, right? Mm-hmm. Or yeah. uh, if you play Serena, you're definitely going to play night match on, you know, night match on Ash. Right. Uh, and then Kevin Anderson, you play on Armstrong, which is, you know, because he got to the finals in 2017, right? So he, mm-hmm. he's entitled to a big court. And then you play Lorenzi, and they're like, oh, okay, we're going to move you all to court five. <laughs> right. <laughs> so how, how do you of- deal with that? Were you like – because some people are relieved to get moved to the small court. And some right. people, you know, are like, oh, man, I was hoping to play on, on Armstrong because it's more fans, more hype. How did you, how did mm-hmm. you, you can be honest, how'd you feel? No, yeah. No, I look, I, you can look at it both ways because, like, I like, I love all the atmosphere and crowd and everything. I love, you know, playing against a lot of people. And so I was like, cool, you know, I'm going to be on Armstrong. You know, it's going to be really crowded I'm sure and I just wanted to play on that court but then when I moved over to five um it's definitely a smaller court but then it's also a better draw so I mean you could look at it both ways but I'm happy it went 
for, uh, with Lorenzi. It was because I had a, more of a shot, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, so in court five, you don't have as much running room as you do on mm-hmm. Armstrong. Right. Uh, because, you know, obviously the court is a smaller court. Fans are right up on you. Do you think that that benefits your game style? Are you are you a player that wants to hug the line and sort of play a little bit more sort of in the court? Are you a player that wants to sort of retrieve, defend, counterpunch? Because that's sort of, you know, like at this level, you start asking for particular courts based on mm-hmm. your game style. Like, hey, I'd like to defend a little bit. I need a little bit bigger court so I can mm-hmm. back up and, you know, cover the court a little bit more or, you know, more aggressive guys. Like, let me step up I like a small court so I can kind of take the action to him which 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 type of player are you um I would say probably the small court I, I did feel like it helped me on the on the smaller courts just because I like to stay closer to the baseline and I sometimes on those bigger courts I could get pretty far back almost for no reason just because there's so much running room and also I'm not used to those bigger courts so I, I know I did think it helped me and I like the yeah, I'm gonna have to hopefully get used to the bigger courts as I'm, you know, uh, getting playing more matches. But um, yeah, no, I liked that court, court five, and I feel like it helped me just so I could like stay more to the baseline and don't get too far back because there's less running room. Have you ever tried installing a security camera in your house or apartment? The wires, the brackets, the screws. It's a mess and it takes half your day. And if you rent, good luck convincing your landlord that the holes you drilled were a necessary improvement. That's why the Bodyguards 360 security camera was so awesome to find. The camera rotates to give you a 360 degree view of the room so you only need one camera to eliminate blind spots that you might get from other cameras. You can set it up in seconds because it doesn't require wires or brackets and you can keep an eye on all your prized possessions all day long through an app. It's great. I can see what's going on in my home whenever I want, no matter where I am. You can get up to 30 bucks off the camera by going to bodyguards.com slash AC Sports. It's a little tricky, though. You spell bodyguards with a Z. B-O-D-Y-G-U-A-R-D-Z dot com slash AC Sports. Use promo code AC Sports to get 30 bucks off today. All right, so you play Kalamazoo in... One. Oh, yeah. 19. Then the pandemic hit. And then after the pandemic, you win it again. So when you look at that, you look, you say, this person got it right during the pandemic. This person was able to train and keep moving forward in the pandemic. What did you do last year that clearly worked, right? And move and help keep your game sharp, move you forward to the point where you win Kalamazoo again. I told myself right when COVID hit, I think when it was like six weeks off of all tournaments or something, I think it was back in March or February when it got really bad. And I was like, okay, I could either take it easy, maybe like a lot of people, or I could really try to buckle down, try to focus on my game here. And uh, like the self motivation, just like, focus on that and I told myself let's just do that and try to look at this like a six week eight week training block until the next tournament and so I did that until eight months actually I didn't play any (laughs) tournaments I know it's gonna be that long I was like whoa but um yeah I didn't play any for eight months Uh, my first tournament was back in November um but yeah no I I felt like I did a the most I can uh, during the COVID time it was tough because I was back home in San Diego and all the gyms were closed. California was really bad. And so like we had to order dumbbells, order some exercise stuff. And I just really try to make the most of it because everything was shut down. But now I was hitting every day trying to find courts because like they closed my dad's place where he coaches off, like almost every public public place was like closed. So we try to like find courts somewhere, like calling people. Um, But no, it was... You know, it's sad, you know, the COVID thing, but it really did help me. I felt like having that training. Now, was your hitter uh, living with you at the time? No. So I I was much younger. So I was actually hitting with my younger brother every day. He's 15 now. His name's Trevor. And so I was hitting with him a lot. 
uh, pretty much every day. Then also uh, Brandon Nakashima, because we live close by in San Diego. So nah. I was sitting with him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was sitting with him and uh, Marcos Duran a lot, too. Oh, yeah, Marcos. Yeah. Oh, so you had it good. You, yeah, you no, we tried to good. make the most of it. Mm-hmm. That, that, so I, I was uh, B Knox coach for World Team Tennis last year. Oh, I saw you there actually. Yeah, on TV. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I was there when he got his first massage from Jeannie Bouchard. B Knox B Knox won the match for us. He won the last match for us and saved the day. So the MVP yeah. of the day gets a massage. So I remember I when I saw that from Jeannie. Oh yeah. man, he was about to lose his mind. I was like, hold it together, B Knock, hold it together. We- <laughs> I know. I think I texted him. I was like, how'd you feel after that? He was like, oh, amazing. Or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully he doesn't hear this. <laughs> Sorry, Brandon. If you're oh, he's going to go here. And then the next oh, yeah. day, he got MVP again and got the massage from Jeannie and Sloan at the same time. And he's like, stop, guys, stop. I can't handle it. I can't handle it. <laughs> that was even. Wow. He was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, lucky him. Good old team <laughs> I know. All right, so yeah. last year, you get a wild card to the French Open, which everybody For would juniors. kill. For juniors. Oh, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Everyone would kill just to, even if it's a, a junior wild card, to go and play. Anybody would kill for that. Why is you turn it down? I just didn't want to do juniors again. Uh, I just wanted to keep it as the pros and, I like, um, we just never thought about playing any juniors like Kalamazoo, just because if you win that, you know, you get a good prize into a, a men's. So that's why I played that. But I just wanted to train and just focus on my game. And I just didn't really want to go to French Open for the juniors. You don't want to be locked in that bubble eating Uber Eats every yeah. night. I know. And the Stuck bubble the too is tough. I know. Taking COVID yeah. tests every day. Jeez, I heard about that. I know. Oh, yeah. I was there. I wake up, look at my phone, and they send you a text reminder. They're like, don't forget to take your PCR test before you leave the hotel. And I'm like, I wonder if I just leave the hotel where they just forget about me. And you mm-hmm. do it, and you get another reminder. You didn't take your, <laughs> your PCR oh my test. Oh, so Yeah. It was rough. Yeah, it sounded rough. All right, so you preparing for the U.S. Open now. You just won yeah. a zoo. What are you doing now? Uh, if anything different between preparing for Kalamazoo, which is a junior event, and now headed to the U.S. Open? Um, before, I still didn't really play too many matches. So I was just training a lot, trying to do practice matches just because of COVID. But um, yeah, now it's going to be, now it's where it starts, you know, playing the men's because it's much different playing men's than juniors, I feel like. Um, but yeah, no, I'll probably do some, I'll do a lot of three out of five sets coming up in the next few days I took uh I won it two days ago so I took yesterday off I'll take I went to the gym today I took it off but then I'll start start it back up tomorrow um but yeah no definitely it's going to be hot too in New York so you know more fitness than usual um just try to prepare as much as possible with my team to get ready so I won't cramp again hopefully like two years ago against Lorenzi (laughs) Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. So 2018 was the hottest U.S. Open in history. And you played in 19. But the year before that, I remember at like 12 o'clock, it was like 105 in the seats and like 125 on the court. So the U.S. Open, I feel like the last couple of years has been getting hotter and hotter, which makes it more physical and physical and physical. So... What do you do for fitness, right? Because in the juniors, you know, fitness is sort of a thing you do, but it's not a thing you invest in, right? Mm -hmm. When you get to the pros, you see people not only invest in the coaching, but full-time, you know, fitness coaches, physios, all that kind of Mm -hmm. thing. So what what do you do for fitness now? Yeah, it's a lot of little things. It's not, I always thought it would just be tennis, but now it's the hydration, fitness, taking care of my body, stretching, um, all kinds of things. But uh, mainly I I'm just working on it with my team to my trainer, just trying to get bigger and stronger, but now, uh, we're going to do, I still been doing fitness a lot, but now we're going to up it even a little bit extra, try to focus on a few things I need to work on, uh, like the assault bike. I've been doing that. Ooh. We're going to get on that and that's going to be tough. 
Ooh, that's, yeah, that's always tough. I know. So we're going to be doing that. Tons of reps, um, anything just to, I'm not sure. Uh, it's just going to be every day, but it's going to be a lot of all kinds of things uh, leading up to US Open. It's going to be warm there. All right. So now you're going to play US Open for the second time. So you're officially done with juniors. You age out of Kalamazoo? Yeah, no. So now mm-hmm. you're done. So now you're a full time tennis. I know a lot of coaches were probably sending you letters just in case you decided to play a year or two. Are you going to consider playing a year or two? Is it one of those things where it's like, hey, let me decide, see how the open goes, and then mm-hmm. make a decision? And if so, what schools are sort of on that short list if you decide? Yeah, I mean, I never, pretty much my whole life, never thought about college, to be honest. Um, I just wanted to go for my dreams, uh, just, you know, just play the pros, uh, hopefully at a young age. And when I won uh, Kalamazoo at 16, that's when I turned pro at, at US Open. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, I never, even now, just I haven't thought about college at all. But if I had to, man, I would probably say UCLA. Cause I really like LA a lot, but um, yeah, so I won't. Despite you, so are they, were they, are they still reaching out despite that or they don't even reach out anymore? No, not anymore. Uh, two years ago at Kalamazoo, they were reaching out a ton. Um, but then now, I don't know, they may know, or I, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't gotten anything from colleges. Oh, okay. We have three kids, four if you count our business, Little and Lively. We've grown so much over the years. We used to deliver clothes to our friends in the neighborhood, and now we're sending packages halfway around the world. Yeah, using Google Ads really helped our customers find us, but figuring it out wasn't easy at first. That's why Google is offering one-on-one support to help you build a marketing plan. Just go to g.co slash ads slash more customers to schedule your call. That's g.co slash ads slash more customers. This is the Tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray. And we are here with Zach Spider, the young up-and-coming superstar who is about to play in his second U.S. Open main draw. So you haven't quite got the bag yet, right? But I remember, you know, a couple of my best friends made it to the NBA. And they were just waiting to make it. They had a list of things that they wanted to do when they finally made it and got the bag. So what's on your, what's on your list of things that you want to do when you get yourself settled, get situated, you know, get a couple zeros, let's say six zeros in your account. What's on your list of things that you just want to treat yourself to? Um, Ooh, I haven't really thought about that actually. Um, I, I always get people with that question. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely going to help out my family as possible. I, I'm, that's going to be first, my parents or uh, just my family, help them out. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to be smart with it for sure. I won't spend like my younger brother. Well, I know my younger brother, he would spend it on cars or whatever it is, but I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm going to try to be smart. Well, you, you didn't say buy Trevor a car. I mean, I thought that was going to be like, eh, maybe I'll buy him a little Oh, okay yeah I actually i actually told him uh if i win us open this this year he wants a maserati and so i was like if i win us open this year i'll get you a maserati <laughs> so we'll see but no he's gonna, um, he's gonna be cheering harder than ever he's gonna be jumping up oh, i know <laughs> i know yeah, i know he's so funny but um yeah I got to think about that. I really don't really have an answer, but. Oh yeah, you, you uh, got to think about that because everybody gets something. So let me ask you this then. Does Trevor want to play pro and follow your footsteps or is he like, you know what? I think I want to go to college, you know, have a little bit of normalcy. Uh, mm-hmm. what, do, what do you think? His yeah, goal? he's doing the same route as me, actually. He hasn't played any tournaments in four years. He's 15 now. So he's doing the same thing. He actually has his first tournament coming up in a month in texas it's an itf junior event just to see kind of where he is with his game but um you know i mean he wants to go pro too so hopefully it happens for him too but yeah he's invested in it so is he going with you to the open he is he'll meet me there oh man 
That's a dream come true for him. Oh, I know. Now, let me ask you this. Is he at the level where he could warm you up? We actually talked about that. I, I told him, bring your rackets. Just maybe if we get on ash, you know, we could, we could hit a little bit. Because that happened two years ago, too. I got to hit a little bit on ash. Not with my brother. With uh, It was actually with Roger. But um, Ooh, I, I told him. Uh, actually, not as tight. Because I hit with him at Indian Wells. So, like, oh. he remembered me. Um, God, Indian Wells. Yeah, it was super tight. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah um, oh, man. When, you, when you get on ash and like even if the stadium's empty and you know like the espn booth they're up there setting up players are in the boxes you don't really know who's watching it just makes you tight oh i know yeah <laughs> and the court is huge like there's so much room um yeah yeah no i always feel like there's like someone watching even if it's uh, like nobody in there um don't don't yeah. don't do that to Trevor. Don't do that to Trevor. I know. Don't put him on yeah. ash and make him warm you up. He's gonna be so tight, it's not even gonna be funny. Don't do that to him. Let him let him like go yeah. on like P7 or something like that, and then warm mm -hmm. you up just to get the, the, the butterflies out. I know, yeah. But I told him bring the rackets, and uh my older brother is actually gonna come too. He lives in Austin, Texas. So he went oh. two years ago too. So uh yeah, I had two uh, he could play a little bit. He played baseball when uh, he was younger. Okay. Yeah. Now, when but, you say a little bit, are we talking like ladies 3.5 or are we talking like men's 4.0? Ooh, I wish I could remember. I think he was good. He was pretty good. Uh, yeah. No, he was good for sure. I'm but he won't be warming you up. Him. My older brother? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, I think he'll just be watching. <laughs> uh -huh. he, he can carry the bag. Yeah, I think he did that two years ago, actually. Yeah, he watched me. Man. Yeah. But, yeah, how funny. Well, man, we, uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I've watched you over the past couple of years. Uh, I know you hit with B-Not. Uh, that San Diego area is full of talent. I want to congratulate you. I want to wish you luck. You know, it's a, it's a dream come true to be able to play the U.S. Open. I was curious as to how you could pass up on a wild card to the French Open. I mean, not many people pass up <laughs> Paris. that one was like he did what uh, yeah but uh, it, it clearly worked in your favor because whatever you did you know it, it uh it put you in a good position so man i wanted to wish you luck uh america continues to need young up-and-comers and i think you know when you think about these podcasts and the things that we do at, at tennis channel uh it's sometimes hard for the player that's 15 to 16 to sort of hear roger's story and connect but for you to be in the middle of your sort of rise, I think could be a lot of inspiration to those who are 14 to 15, right? I think you're sort of closer to where they are and they can see, okay, I'm 15, he's 18, we, I can get there, right? But sometimes mm -hmm. when you're 15, it's hard to like listen to Monfils who just got married and 36 years old, you know, to mm -hmm. that 20 year gap. So right. Next. So I appreciate you sharing your story with us uh, and I'll see you at the open. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. This All right, awesome. man, thank you. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with Zach Spider. Look out for him, cheer for him. Is one of the next up and coming Americans, uh, along with Sebi Corda and Francis and B Not. You know, continue to cheer for him and support him. Thank you all for listening.